And it's my really great honor to introduce our first speaker. The field of learning analytics is basically a bricolage field. We try to connect many different fields. And obviously, very frequently, we also have this question, what about privacy? What about ethics? What about legal implications? I quite frequently hear the point that these concerns are like barriers to learning analytics. But recently, even in our most recent uh, editorial, the Journal of Learning Analytics, we wrote that privacy and ethics are enablers of learning <coughs> analytics. They are not barriers. And we need to sort out all these things before we can actually really turn to, into the making real impact in the field of learning analytics. Therefore, uh, we have a great speaker today. It's Miral Hildenbrandt. Uh, she is a professor of looking into interfacing of law and technology at uh, Free University in Brussels. But she also uh, holds a part-time post uh, having a really important uh, topic of her chair, and that's basically smart environments, data protection, and uh, the rule of law. So I'm sure we will get uh, some really good insights into these important questions that are concerning the field of learning analytics as well. Uh, Mirel uh, particularly looks into the issues related to data-driven intelligence and their implications in general on uh, data protection and the rule of law. She's a philosopher and lawyer, but one interesting thing in her basically bio is that she li really loves to work with computer scientists, lawyers, but hopefully we'll convince her to work also with learning sciences after this conference. Mirel. Thank you. So, can, oh yes, everybody can hear me. I can hear that myself. So when you invite a lawyer and a philosopher to a conference like this, be sure that this, this talk, this keynote, is going to be text-driven, not data-driven. And to compensate for that, because I've noticed that computer scientists are less text-driven than, for instance, people like lawyers. To compensate that a bit, I have a cartoon-driven presentation. <laughs> um, that's also for my own fun, of course. Now, the first, the first opening slide, I don't know if you can <coughs> properly read and see what, uh, what it says. But this is a mummy who is bent over her son or daughter. We're not really sure. And she says, but sweetie, children are the backbone of our educational system. Now, why do I use this, this cartoon? Because I think, and this is what I want to talk about, and I'm sure that you will all agree, that the educational system, the institutions, and everything that is there that helps people to learn, is there for these individual people and not the other way around. Um, and it would be great if us agreeing to that <coughs> would be enough. But we know, of course, that there are very strong incentives to sometimes turn this around. And I don't think this needs further exp <laughs> explanation. Uh, there is an enormous need um, to go for data, more data. I usually speak in these sort of talks and presentations about data obesitas. I think we have now began to turn data into uh, a kind of a fetish, which I think is very dangerous. That means that uh, this text-driven part will be rather critical, but be sure that I basically love the idea of e-learning, of learning analytics. I think it's extremely important and offers many opportunities. Having said that, I can now move to a more critical part. This is uh, just for fun. I saw in the uh, in New York Times a couple of weeks ago that the game Kahoot um, has now flooded in the United States a lot of schools. It's a, a quiz. You probably know about it <coughs> better than I do. But I found it very interesting. This is a tweet, a quote from a tweet from a student posting on Twitter as at bean salad. I finished fifth in the at get Kahoot quiz. How does the Constitution 
protect freedom of expression. Out of 22 players with 4.754 points, this, for some people, raises a number of um, questions. And it's also related to this. Now, this is, for me, a cartoon that can be, can be read in two ways, and that's very important, because they're both very interesting. You could say, well, these people with, with these, uh, this stuff on their head, that is old school testing, very boring kind of testing. And I would imagine that um, this quote, again, a very recent quote from the New York Times, somebody saying student testing is like using a thermometer to try to diagnose what kind of cancer an individual has. Hmm? You could say, well, that's all old school. And what we're doing now with learning analytics is <coughs> really looking at the data, assuming that data is the same as facts. You can also turn this round and look at it from another perspective and say, my God, what are we doing? We're only looking at data. We're continuously doing things like A-B testing on kids in an invisible way, so these kids are not going to have all these tubes on their heads. And they may not even want to go outside anymore because everything is there. So that's a, a very different way of looking at the same cartoon. OK, another <coughs> slide with cartoons. Um, I am definitely going to take you out of your comfort zone soon when I begin reading all this text. Um, and again, Perhaps learning analytics and its application, engaging with it, will take uh, institutions that have been working in a similar way um, since the uptake of the printing press for a very long time, will be taken out of their comfort zone, which is in principle a good thing. <coughs> but beware, because the next comfort zone is arriving. Okay. So, human beings learn from the moment they are born, maybe even before that. They, we, learn because we are vulnerable, because we can suffer, because we have something to lose. We learn because we can die, because we will die, like all living organisms, or nearly all. And we want to delay that moment and flourish. We learn for the joy of learning. We are aware that we learn. And we help others to learn, our children, pupils, friends, colleagues. Now, machines learn because we configure them as such, to perform specific tasks for us, or even because we will learn from them about new solutions to known problems, about problems that we have missed. And we configure machines to learn for the pure joy of it as our part of creativity, as part of our creativity. Now, this conference is about learning analytics, about data-driven applications that help students to improve their learning behaviors, and their applications that help schools, colleges, universities, <coughs> to manage, to coordinate, and to administrate information and communication about the progress of their student performance. All this is measured in machine-readable format. Whichever part of the learning process cannot or is not made machine-readable will not be part of the learning analytics. Ah, we're having a cinema view. That's great. <laughs> um, you can see the slide better. slides better and me worse. That's good. Um, Okay, so whatever part of the learning process cannot or is not uh, transferred into machine-readable format will not be part of the analytics and therefore not be part of the performance metrics. And to the extent that these performance metrics will come to determine our learning processes, whatever remains off the radar of LA will not visibly contribute to the flourishing of the students <coughs> or the learning institutions that we develop and create. Now, this has consequences for individual liberty and dignity of an individual person. 
there is a famous legal philosopher, uh, Dworkin, who summed up democracy and the rule of law, which are often seen as contradictory forces, under the heading of <coughs> equal respect and concern for each individual person. That means one person, one vote, but it also means that human rights, which are about the individual, overrule majoritarian disrespect. <clears throat> so it limits the dictatorship of a majority. Being tested by learning machines may lure us into thinking like them, simply because we need to anticipate how they anticipate us. And we may start thinking in terms of behaviors instead of actions. And we may be manipulated into learning instead of being challenged to develop a critical distance. Now, to investigate such potential implications, it is crucial to distinguish between, first, two levels of <coughs> intervention. And this is already looking forward to um, data protection legislation also. The first level of learning analytics is about interventions at the level of an identifiable student. But it still takes two different kinds of interventions. On the one hand, when you're collecting data from them, behavioral data, whatever data. And on the other hand, when you apply the results of learning analytics <coughs> to her. Whether or not she's aware of that application doesn't matter. If you apply it to an identifiable student, you are, um, you're touching on an individual student. And this has consequences for data protection. It's also important to note that identifiability includes indirect identification. <coughs> and it also includes being singled out. So it's not about whether you know somebody's name, but whether you can single somebody out to target her. This is all about um, data protection law. Sorry, we're, st we're sticking here for a moment. The data collected may be about previous grades, previously attended schools or universities, records of TV, teachers' evaluation, grading, all types of tests, and even data about alumni that enable to link school <coughs> or college behaviors with employment achievements. This all sounds like automation of previously manual administration. LA, however, also concerns the collection of behavioral data traced and tracks from new types of software or relatively new types of software that enable what is called sometimes e-learning. Such behavioral data may include keystroke, click stream behaviors that trace reading habits at a micro level, time spent on various tasks, biometric behavior like uh, eye movements that indicate boredom or loss of focus. Now it's pivotal to note that such behavioral data are now also being derived from sources outside the educational setting. You may concern social media data, quantified self metrics, or other types of data that may, for instance, be bought from data brokers. I don't know if that happens yet, but it will probably happen. Such out-of-context data may be correlated with educational data to figure out how a student's background, lifestyle, or context correlates with her learning achievements. This may be legal or unlegal. It may be ethical or unethical. What is important is that it's become possible. Next to capturing student data, interventions at this level include feedback for the students, such as real-time feedback during e-learning exercises, early warning systems, etc. The first level also includes interventions, as I already said, regarding the students that she may not be aware of, such as real-time configuration of her adaptive e-learning software, placement in a specific group or class, automated evaluation of tests, referral to a counselor, <coughs> but also selection for awards, grants, etc. 
or being categorized as a potential dropout or failure to meet the standards of a course or an institution. It could even include decisions based on inferences concerning health risks, drug abuse, earning capacity, financial resources, or public security risks. I always say any data that you collect anywhere in the private sector or in a semi-public sector at some point becomes available for law enforcement. The second level of learning analytics, this is not about um, interaction with identifiable students. It concerns the analysis of data that prepare potential interventions and this data can be either anonymous or personal. If it is personal data, it can be either pseudonymous or not. <coughs> if it is anonymized, it rules out the applicability of data protection law. Pseudonymization does not rule that out, but it can qualify as proper protection of data. Now, I'm just going to give you the uh, definition of pseudonymous data in the upcoming general data protection regulation that has now been voted, so it's going to be in force within two years and it will be applicable to this type of data. Um, and I, I thought it might be interesting for you already to see how pseudonymous data is defined. So just taking out an identifier <coughs> is not, in terms of the law, enough to speak of pseudonymization. The processing of personal data in such a way that the data can no longer be attributed to a specific person without the use of additional information, as long as such additional information is kept separate and subject to technical and organizational measures to ensure that non-attribution. So this is very important to keep in mind if you're doing data analytics and you want to come under the light regime of pseudonymous data, your obligations will be lighter, uh, then you have to take care that the data that you keep separate from the identifiers comply with this. And <coughs> you will have to do repeated checks on whether, for instance, you haven't amassed so aggregated so many uh, pseudonymized data that it becomes very easy to re-identify. Okay, let's look at the second level of learning analytics. Um, this type of analytics can be conducted, for instance, by means of knowledge discovery in databases or machine learning, hoping to develop a non-trivial process of identifying valid, novel, potentially useful and ultimately understandable patterns in data, and or to help data-driven machines to learn from experience E with respect to some class of task T, and performance measure P, if its performance at task T as measured by P improves with experience E. I love this definition of machine learning from Tom Mitchell. I, I tell it to lawyers, for instance, to, <coughs> sorry, to give them a feel of <coughs> machine learning. And I always, I put it on a slide and I say, now this is pure poetry. I'm not so sure they get my point. You have no doubt recognized the canonical definitions of KDD of FIAT and machine learning of Mitchell. The second level of intervention is about the detection of relevant correlations, associations role, etc. Basically, this level is all about pinpointing the key classifiers that will allow teachers and their institutions <coughs> to gain insights into the data points that seem key to their students' learning capabilities and their organization's achievements. This can be done by means of clustering. Well, I, I don't have to explain that to you. It is this second level that forages patterns in big data to develop more adequate interventions at the first level, to improve the performance of students, advise them, etc. Um, such patterns may be about when are students ready to move on to the next topic, when are students falling behind in a course, what grade is a student likely to get without the intervention, A-B testing? Should a student be referred to a counselor for help? This was quoting from an editorial of, uh, in, uh, on learning analytics that uh, sums up some of the key objectives of learning analytics. And it actually proposes to invest into the analysis 
of so-called unstructured data to further the objectives of monitoring and improving the cognitive and intellectual development of learners. Um, the editorial actually commends this wonderful comprehensive learning architecture that integrates the analytics for structured and unstructured data by means of a prediction engine, a content engine, an intervention engine, a back feedback engine, and a measurement engine on the left side of the slide. The objectives and the various engines help to remind us of the close relationship between both levels of intervention since the second level is basically used to target students at the first level. Imer, by providing them, the students, with feedback based on the knowledge that is mined, or providing the teachers, institutional management, employers, or others that pay for the education with advice and relevant prediction. Let's keep this in mind when discussing the privacy and other fundamental rights that may be infringed when putting learning analytics to the test. Anonymization and pseudonymization, the operations that take place at the second level, is and should be a primary concern, yes. But there are other major concerns that we cannot address by de-identifying the data used for LA. This is not just about privacy, but all about, also about non-discrimination, and also about due process and the presumption of innocence. And even more important, and I hope to explain that to you, it concerns the affordances of learning institutions and the kind of capabilities they enable for human learners. Before moving to these human rights infringements, I want to develop an understanding of what machine learning does as a tool to contribute to human learning and how it may transform the practice and concept of human <coughs> learning itself. And I will do this by investigating three ways of learning as a machine, which I will coin the Pavlov approach, the Simon approach, and the Gibson approach. <coughs> After that, I will investigate how second level interventions may impact fundamental rights, and finally, I will explain how data protection by design, data protection by design is going to be a legal obligation if you process personal data with a high risk, how data protection by design may help us to prevent data obesities, loss of reputation, and untrustworthy LA from destroying the potential of LA, I call learning analytics LA. It's not about uh, Los Angeles, as a tool for better education. Let's start with the Pavlov <laughs> approach. In the beginning of the 20th century, psychologist Ivan Pavlov developed the so-called stimulus response theory on learning mechanisms. He based the theory on a series of experiments with a dog allegedly demonstrating that behavior is the result of a recurrent chain of stimuli. These stimuli are sensed objects and or behaviors such as food or signals associated with the provision of food. And these change of stimuli supposedly trigger subsequent responses actuated by means of specific behaviors such as producing saliva in anticipation of food. Interestingly, Pavlov was actually one of the first behaviorists claiming to base his theoretical insights <coughs> on observable behaviors without any reference to the mind, which he treated as a black box. And this supposedly delivered objective scientific fact-finding instead of what he thought uh, subjective theories of the mind of psychologists like Wilhelm Wundt, who was then uh, a great psychologist and based his theory on introspection. One of the assumptions of Pavlov's theory was the idea that behavior must be explained by means of physiological reflexes that can be tested in an experimental setting. Quite some behavioral responses seem to depend on adaptation to the environment instead of innate 
reflexes. So it was a, like a progress to say that animals are not doing everything instinctively, but that they have the capacity to learn. Um, and Popkov de developed these uh, nice experiments uh, to prove that animal responses can be the result of acquired reflexes based on physiological association of specific events, the ringing of a bell, with other specific events, the provision of food. If this sounds very boring to you, it does to me, but um, maybe differences. Um, Pavlov's theory was further developed by Watson and Skinner, the big guys of uh, behaviorism, and is actually closely connected with Turing's thought experiment and Daniel Dennett's intentional stance. Turing and Dennett choose both abstract from issues around consciousness, focusing on whether observable behavior can help us to anticipate an organism's or even a person's next move. It'd be interesting to, to wonder whether this is also what you're trying to do with LA. Watson, for instance, suggested that Quote, the interest of the behaviorist in man's doings is more than the interest of the spectator. He wants to control man's reactions as physical scientists want to control and manipulate other natural phenomena. It is the business of behavioristic psychology to be able to predict and control human activity. To do this, it must gather scientific data by scientific methods. Only then can the trained behaviorist predict giving the stimulus what reaction will take place, or given the reaction state what the situation or stimulus is <coughs> that caused the reaction. Clearly, behaviorism has strong links with determinism and physicalism, assuming that the mind is ultimately a matter of matter, while in fact, the mind may not really matter once we can detect the mechanisms that rule behavior, which is assumed to be subject to the laws of causality. Contemporary hairs of the behaviorist approach can be found in, for instance, Pentland's social physics and Helbing's computational social science. I'm not going into that, but you could say that their approaches to social science are akin to social engineering aiming to unlock the trove of knowledge that can be mined from data different applications and or computational simulations, synthetic data, for instance, of human society. Um, Pentland and Helbing are seeking the key to understand individuals as nodes in a network, hoping to contribute to the engineering of a more fair and sustainable <coughs> environment, uh, society. The idea is that if we know statistically how people learn, how they develop which conditional reflexes, we can rec reconfigure their environment, the set of relevant stimuli, to make sure they indeed learn what we, interesting question here, who is we, think they should learn in terms of behavior. Though there may be noble intent behind such social engineering, it entails the assumption that we learn as a machine, and this easily leads to attempts to manipulate us into supposedly good behaviors, as if we were mindless pawns in a game of chess or go. Such a view misses out on the complexity of societal networks, the plasticity of the human brain, and the vulnerability as well as the creativity of both individual humans and their society. Now you could say, well, this refers to the intractability of human learning. And some would suggest that the increasing of computational power will push the threshold of this intractability. But there is also the question of computability. Our life world, as humans, is built on the ambiguity of natural language that is generative of a complex and dynamic web of meaning. And this curious amalgam of uncertainty, that is core to natural language, and creativity, that is also core to natural language, um, that, that springs from our language-saturated environment. This uncertainty and 
um, <coughs> creativity is what holds us together, but also what sets us apart from other animals and maybe also from machines. A mechanistic understanding of human learning that ignores our uh, capabilities for generating meaning and for giving reasons for our actions has a number of highly problematic ethical and epistemological implications. Now, I, this is a question, and this might be related to a move from teaching students, that is putting new knowledge in front of them, sharing acquired knowledge, explaining reasons, explaining causal connections, teaching, to inducing learning processes with students by manipulating their environment in a way that induces them to acquire specific insights. Now one could be radical and say this corrupts their autonomy their capability to make up their own mind about how and what to learn. <clears throat> so let's move on to the Simon approach. In the second half of the 20th century, Herbert Simon wrote an intriguing article under the title, Why Should Machines Learn? This was a time when machine learning was hardly a success, and notably what was then called nerve net learning, achieved next to nothing for a number of reasons. And Simon, um, however, makes a number of highly relevant observations already then about the differences between human and machine learning. And one of his main points refers to what he calls the tediousness of human learning. He says, human learning is such a slow process. It takes such a long time. To achieve a certain level of knowledge, people spend many years in school. Whereas once a computer has been programmed with specific knowledge, this can easily be transferred from one computer to the next. No reiterant learning process is needed. Quote, we should ask whether we really want to make the computer go through that tedious process or whether machines should be programmed directly to perform tasks, avoiding humanoid learning entirely. Only one computer would have to learn. Not everyone would have to go to school." Unquote. Now, we may of course smile about the naivety of the observation Simon seems to endorse, but I guess Simon was using the rhetorical device of a tongue-in-cheek making the point that such an approach would only work if the goal of learning were a matter of doing the same task over and over again, but more efficiently. If, however, the goal of learning is to acquire the ability to perform a wide range of tasks, or if learning refers to discovering new knowledge, finding a way to retain it, then maybe the tediousness of human learning may be the best way to optimize the process. Well, that is indeed, according to um, Simon, the case, because programs facing real-life problems are highly complex, and they suffer numerous bugs and computational artifacts. This results in them ending up as being highly inefficient and ineffective in the course of time. So, Simon says, instead of putting all hope in one program, Human society consists of numerous independent programs that allow for new beginnings. Quote, old programs do, do not learn. They simply fade away. So do human beings. Their undebuggable programs replaced by younger, possibly less tangled ones in other human heads. So the death and the birth of individual humans serve to resolve the legacy problem for optimizing learning programs. Simon's ironic message is that the fact that my knowledge and insights can only be transferred to others <coughs> by means of great effort on both sides is not a disadvantage, but an incredibly smart way to ensure creative and robust adaptation. Anyone who claims to have invented or engineered the optimal learning machine for a particular set of problems must be put to the test by means of retrials and alternative machines. 
taking note of Walpert's theorem that we cannot be sure it will work for other types of problems. Okay, let's move on to the third approach, the Gibson approach. I think this is a very interesting approach. James Gibson developed one of the most crucial concepts for our current age, that of an affordance. That concept is firmly embedded in evolutionary theory, physical reality, psychological inquiry, and a deep understanding of the relationship between a living entity and its environment. It skips naive attempts to divide the world in mind and matter without discarding values or mental capabilities. Let me quote his own definition of an affordance. He says the affordances of the environment are what it offers the animal, human animal or other animals. What it provides or furnishes either for good or ill the verb to afford is found in the dictionary, but the noun affordance is not. Maybe now, not then. He says, I made it up. I mean by it something that refers to both the environment and the animal in a way that no existing term does. And it implies the complementarity of the animal and the environment. So Gibson is not interested in separating objective physical properties of the subjective experience of the perceiving organism, that's possible, but he is interested in something else. He's interested in the actionable properties of an environment, which obviously depend on the agent, the agent that depends on that particular environment, which means that each type of agent does has its own ecological niche, the set of affordances that the environment for a specific type of agent offers. For a human being at a very basic level, uh, that for instance means breathable air, walkable surfaces, graspable things, but also other humans capable of speaking or learning their language. For humans affordances are, in terms of Pavlov, the set of stimuli that enable and constrain them to behave one way or another, including enabling them to learn new behaviors or even to unlearn innate behavior. Other than Pavlov's determinism, Gibson's keen attention for the mutual shaping of an agent <coughs> and its ecological niche celebrates creativity and renounces the idea that either the agent or the niche are defined by their current properties. In terms of Simon, we can add, machines similarly depend on a particular environment that affords them to learn one thing and not another. As we know, many machines require an artificial environment that is geared to their behavioral potential, well, for instance, preventing them to, from harming their human masters. In robotics, that is called the envelope, a controlled environment that makes sure the robots can navigate its environment without um, <coughs> hurting humans. Now, if environments are sets of affordances, they are contingent on the type of organism that is able to perceive and act upon this environment. Fish don't do well on land. We don't do well underwater or high up in the air. Uh, surfaces that can sustain ants may not sustain elephants. So an ecological niche is not so much a habitat, but the actionability of the environment. Now, obviously, Humans have managed to reconfigure their ecological niche in myriad ways, with far-reaching consequences for other organisms, as we all know. Major transitions of the affordances of our ecological niche have been generated by the introduction of calculating tools and writing tools, including the printing press. Each of them afforded an entirely novel learning mechanism including the retention of what has been learned outside the body of an individual human. And this has triggered the institution of formal learning and teaching institutions such as schools, universities, as well as archives and libraries and other repositories of retained knowledge such as computers and computer servers. What fascinates me 
is how Gibson's approach enables us to raise the question of how e-learning and other types of learning analytics will transform the affordances of our learning institutions, changing our ecological niche and thus also ourselves. Where so far other agents in our niche were living organisms, such as animal from cattle to pets, we're now increasingly confronted with mindless agents of our own making, capable of observing us and adapting their behavior to the feedback they gain from ours. It's not just that we use these machines to learn faster or more efficiently, but, and this is very important, they also use us to improve their performance. And finally, we may come to the point of acknowledging that we're actually interacting with them. For instance, training algorithms to learn how to make us learn. Training, uh, training on a training set and checking the outcome on a test set is already a type of interaction, especially where knowing the operations of the software is impossible, like with neural nets, or irrelevant for the outcome. Now, when I teach a human person, I cannot assess her brains and follow the neural operations. And even if I could, they would be incomprehensible for me. This has never stopped us from teaching or interacting with each other. Actually, it keeps us um, sharp. The same goes for teaching a neural net. However, other than living beings, Cyber-physical systems that integrate machine learning have nothing to lose. They cannot suffer or fear death. They can probably simulate that based on synthetic emotions and effective computing. But simulation is not the same as what is simulated. So to the extent that our learning environments become dependent on these systems, this may be cause for concern. What should concern us here is the fact that in order to interact with machines, people need to anticipate how these machines learn. And this goes for those that develop the learning analytics, like I said, the training of algorithms. But it also goes for the students when they interact with e-learning systems that can only respond to their machine-readable behaviors, or when they figure out which of their behaviors is taken into account when decisions are made on their eligibility for grants, admission, to selected courses, etc. As a result, our ecological niche may be increasingly shaped in a way that accommodates learning as a machine by humans. The fact that we can do that is, of course, due to the plasticity of our brain. We're not born with a reading brain. It takes years to change the morphology and the behavior of our brains such that we can read. Um, as I said, once we begin to read, this ecological niche entirely changes. Now, there's no reason to think that we cannot develop a type of brain that is more geared towards mathematics, computation, and calculation, if we decide that is worth the effort. And this might, of course, fast track our interactions with learning analytic systems, enabling a more intuitive understanding of how they operate or even think. But it also may have transformative effects on what it means to be human. OK, let's move on to first level issues. I go back to the first level that I discussed and look at uh, a number of <coughs> uh, fundamental rights. So this is about um, interventions at the level of students, identifiable individuals. It's about collecting their personal data, um, whether within a learning institution or from social network, etc. It's also about applying the results of uh, learning analytics to an individual student, whether she's aware of this or not. Now, at this level, privacy may be concerned whenever data is processed, for instance, shared, 
in a way that violates legitimate expectations, notably when data is shared out of context. And this is at stake when access to the data within the learning institution is uh, not properly secured, unreliable authentication, which results in all kinds of staff being able to look up how a particular student is doing without necessity. It's also at stake if publishers of um, um, blah, 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 electronic textbooks or e-learning software gain access to data of individual students to improve the functionality of their software, or if grant providers demand an abundance of personal data to conduct fraud detection. The tax authority, the police, or the intelligence services may demand access, probably accompanied by a prohibition to communicate about this with a relevant person or anyone else. This could imply that undetected privacy infringement could easily occur depending on the whims of whoever is in charge. Unless a system of safeguards is built into the architecture of the technical systems and the organizational design, privacy is basically up for grabs one could say. And the point here is not at all bad intentions. The point is the transformation of the affordances of our learning institutions. And that is also very much my point with this keynote. When inferences of learning analytics are applied to an individual based on knowledge that is not shared with her, or confronting her with things about herself, that she was not aware of, this may amount to another type of privacy violation. Inferences may indeed indicate health problems, notably concerning mental health, or they may show that students with a certain religious or ethnic background lack specific coping strategies, resulting in failure to finish a course um, or obtain a relevant, relevant degree. That means it is not always about privacy, but also about <coughs> non-discrimination. And I'm sure you're all aware of that. Uh, it may be great to know that people from a certain background, ethnic, religious, gender, economic, geographic, have specific learning disabilities that can be remedied by means of specific interventions based on extensive A-B test designs. But that implies that lots of students will be used as guinea pigs while their sensitive data are employed for scientific research to secure the policy goals of the educational institution or more mundane to increase <coughs> the profits of a service provider. There's of course a lot of uh, commercial software, e-learning software. Now, to the extent that a student is not aware of this, their due process rights are at stake. Actually, they could be placed in certain categories based on clustering techniques that result in classifiers that discriminate. This, this is not necessarily prohibited. They discriminate based on certain features that their nearest neighbors have, though they may not have these features the profiles will often be non-distributive. I assume that you all know what non-distributive is. That has very large implications. To the extent that they are not aware of this, they cannot object, they cannot argue. Indeed, even if they knew about it, they might have a problem to argue their case. Because the categorization they fit may be presented as objective and applicable and could only be countered by means of software verification or training alternative algorithms on the same data set. Then another problem is that the arguments available to object against their being profiled may be restricted because you may have to object via an online system that has pre-formatted the arguments. And if you have an argument that doesn't fit this pre-format, well, you can't make it. Um, of course, also the, the, the entity, either the software or the people that are dealing with these appeals, um, may have formatted responses. The simplest one is, um, the system does not allow this argument, or in your reasoning there is no argument that makes us change our mind. 
this kind of procedures are already common for uh, the taxation office or complaints against telecom providers. Computer says no is popular for good reason. Now this finally touches the presumption of innocence in administrative law other than in criminal law. It is assumed that the government got it right and a citizen has to prove her innocence. So the student may have to prove that the system got it wrong in terms dictated by the system. This is Kafka, not around the corner, but in the middle of the system. And this is not science fiction. And it is not about bad intention. It is again about the consequences of entering another ecological niche with different affordances. And if we don't like these affordances, it is now time to configure this niche in another way. And I hope that that is why you are here. Now let's look at uh, second level issues. Um, they're entirely different because the inferences drawn need not be personal data. Uh, you can do good, let's say, pseudonymization. Anonymization is very difficult the more data you bring together. Um, but uh, it's all about patterns in the data set, linking specific attributes, features, behaviors, background, context, to specific performance metrics to create hindsight, what kind of attributes correspond with what level of performance, foresight, what can we expect if the circumstances remain the same, <coughs> and insight, which interventions could improve future student performance depending on what circumstances. Now the issue at this level that is highlighted is usually privacy in a narrow sense of trying to hide personal data, making sure that the data is protected against unauthorized disclosure. And there is now a number of techniques basically meant to enable big data analytics in compliance with data protection law based on pseudonymization as irreversible in anonymization is usually not an option. So you have frameworks like MIT's Open Personal Data Store with its safe answers module. Max Planck has developed AirCloak with its insights AQR. And at my own research group of digital um, security, we have developed the so-called PEP, PEP framework, polymorphous encryption and pseudonymization. There are a lot more out there. There's a market for this, and that's a very good thing. So they provide sophisticated ways of combining encryption with pseudonym <coughs> pseudonymous sharing. And they basically enable you to run code on raw data without sharing the data. This is highly relevant, uh, and it's a very important way to engage with data protection, especially data minimization. But they do not go to the heart of the matter. Once a service provider, grant provider, insurance company, potential employer, or the own educational institution gets hold of the results of the anal uh, analytics, hmm? it's not personal data, a new set of affordances comes into play. Hmm? So if you look at this, this is a stone, it has certain affordances. Think the stone is the old fashioned system of education. Hmm? It has certain affordances. If you change the, sh the stone, the relationship with these agents and, and the, the capability to act of these agents, uh, our students, is going to change enormously. And the same goes actually for the, um, for the teachers. Also their environment changes and their agency changes. Uh, this is another explanation of what is an affordance? As discussed under first level issues, as soon as the inferences are applied to individual students, the infringements of privacy, non-discrimination, due process, and the presumption of innocence return at full speed. That's why I want to devote the final part of the keynote to the implications of learning analytics for the fundamental core of human learning, that is our capability to reflect on our own behaviors. This capability may be an affordance of written text. The fact that you externalize something 
and can look at it, take a distance from it, be critical about it. But that need not be an affordance of learning analytics. It need not. It depends on how we design, design it. OK, let's look at uh, profiling and data protection by design. Data protection by design is one particular example of uh, legal protection by design. As you all know, the general data protection uh, regulation has been voted two weeks ago. So it's going to be enforced in, uh, in two years. It consolidates and reinforces the core principles of the current data protection directive. But nevertheless, it's going to be a game changer for those who process personal data, notably those who conduct additional processing, thus engaging in secondary usage. Compared to the data protection directive, this new regulation will do three things, among a lot of other things. First, it will create a level playing field for stakeholders that base their business case on the processing of personal data. That way, it will enable them to act ethically sound without being pushed out of the market. So far, if you, if you acted ethically sound, if you cared a lot about data protection, chances were rather big that you would be pushed out of the market. But there is now a threshold in this market, so your competitor will have to also care about these things. This is the result of deterrence. There's going to be very high fines, 4% of global turnover. That means that the, the regulation speaks at the board level. There is, of course, the issue of data breach notification, the transparency requirements um, that will have a high impact on reputation and, for instance, tort liability. This will institute countervailing powers capable of mitigating some of the problematic affordances of LA. And this is basically about speaking law to power. Second, it will require a data protection impact assessment whenever high risk is expected for rights and freedoms of natural persons, which is related to the obligation to implement data protection by default and design. That means that you have to integrate data minimization and other legal obligations into the architecture of the data processing systems. This way, the ecological niche that I was talking about will be reconfigured. The set of affordances uh, that emerges in the wake of large-scale application of LA will change. And this is not merely speaking law to power, but architecting trustworthy infrastructures that reduces privacy and other risks by default, based on technical specifications. Third, the regulation will privilege the processing of pseudonymized data, subject to very stringent conditions. But the, the objective is to enable big data analysis. And in combination with the previous points, creating a level playing field and integrating uh, the data protection into the system, this will provide for an incentive structure that favors systems that enable secondary use for a number of specific purposes while reducing the risk of identification. Again, this will have a transformative impact, impact on the affordances of LA. Data protection by design, however, also applies to the obligation of profile transparency, which is already part of the current legal framework, but further clarified in the regulation. Now, I dare say that profile transparency is the only legal constraint that directly targets the issue of due process and the presumption of innocence. Let's have a quick look at how the regulation um, defines profiling. So profiling is any type of automated processing of personal data to evaluate certain personal aspects in relation to a natural person, in particular to analyze or predict, for instance, behavior. Profile transparency, that is, that is the, the thing that I want to talk about. Profile transparency basically requires three things in terms of providing information to 
individuals, your students. The existence of automated decision making, including profiling, and like it is always in the law, that refers to another article. I will show it to you. So first of all, the existence of profiling. You have to tell your students that you are doing this. Secondly, meaningful information about the lodging involved. So you can't throw algorithms to them, which would also be problematic. But you have to explain how the outcome, on which factors it depends, and how these factors weigh, as well as the significant, this significance and the envisaged consequences of such processing for the data subject. So you have to explain to your student, OK, we have now taken this decision about you based on this kind of learning analytics. This is the logic behind it. This is, this is well, the result, what it comes up with as determining factors. And this can be the consequences for you. And in a learning situation, these consequences can be pretty uh, important. Well, this is um, the articles that it referred back to. Um, basically, this says that your students have a right not to be subject to a decision that is only based on automated processing, including profiling as defined before. If that decision has significant influence or legal effect. And there is another small clause which says that if that decision is based uh, on uh, data like ethnic background, uh, sexual orientation, religion, uh, then that is not allowed at all, even if the student would agree to it. There are exceptions. Law is always full of exceptions, but this is the default. Now here we see how and why the fundamental right to data protection, it is a separate fundamental right, Article 8 in the Charter of the Fundamental Rights of the European Union, it's not the same right as the privacy right. How and why it is not restricted to privacy, but explicitly addresses non-discrimination, due process, and in a sense also the presumption of innocence in its broad sense. Enabling to exercise this right will be the real challenge, as it implies taking your students, our learners, seriously, engaging with them on their own terms, helping them to critically assess the learning algorithms that define their progress. Last uh, minute. Um, human learning cannot be reduced to Pavlov's stimulus response hypothesis. Even animals are actually driven crazy by his experiments that basically disrespect human animal dignity. Uh, the limited set of responses that defines their laboratory situation says little about their repertoire. They develop in normal ecological niches. If you have seen uh, Frank de Waal's, Frans de Waal's last book, you will know what I mean. Simon nicely demonstrated the added value of individual learning processes, clarifying how the tediousness of human learning may be the outcome of an optimization strategy in view of the unfathomable complexity of human society. Taking Gibson seriously, we must acknowledge that this complexity is connected with our language capabilities and the institutional dynamics they require and produce. Our ecological niche has myriad affordances that are continuously renegotiated and attuned to the capabilities they afford, while these capabilities in turn shape and reshape the niche. Core to human learning are creativity, humor, and reflection, corresponding with art, ethics, judgments, politics, and law. Creativity and humor combine detecting the unexpected unexpected with the need to face both life and death. Reflection entails an externalized awareness of what we think we learned instead of succumbing entirely to unconscious learning processes. That is why teaching 
will remain critical to a democracy. Teaching refers to the explicit presentation and explanation of knowledge such that it can be the object of debate and discussion. So while learning analytics may be a great way to induce learning pr processes, as it were, behind a person's back, which is not necessarily wrong or bad, it must be configured or reconfigured in a way that allows for critical reflection on what, but also on how we learn. Therefore, I believe that pseudonymization, encryption, and even discrimination-aware data mining must be complemented with profile transparency and the effective means to object to being profiled as a specific type of learner. This is the end, at least of this keynote. stand between people in morning tea so we can recharge our batteries but just a flag that uh, we really will be in a session over in Hogwarts just across the road there um, where we'll be answering a number of questions so if you're welcome I know that uh, I think we had about eight questions already come through on the form and a few more in tweets that we we'll start to address. I can answer one on behalf of Murali uh, was yes the presentations are all filmed and they'll be available after maybe not necessarily the individual slides for us.